Good evening to everyone. It is of my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce to today's very interesting, but also quite timely, roundtable discussion about the international tax considerations in the disruptive post-COVID-19 era. Undoubtedly, the coronavirus pandemic is a global challenge that requires global response. The economic impacts of the crisis are colossal in every country. Besides that, the pandemic revealed the lack of effective infrastructures, but also the inequalities that exist in many countries, especially in their healthcare systems. States and governments are called to respond to those challenges and at the same time to balance their annual financial seeds, which is not at all an easy exercise. To expand their fiscal space without applying more taxes, it is almost mathematically mandatory that they ought to fight tax evasion and tax avoidance, including illicit financial flows. Just very recently, OECD announced that the cooperation of nearly 100 countries carrying out automatic exchange of information in 2019 enabled their tax authorities to obtain data on 84 million financial accounts held offshore by their residents, covering total assets of 10 trillion euros. We can very easily imagine how many needs countries can cover by applying a fair tax to all these and other hidden assets. It has never been more important to move towards a fairer and more equitable taxation of economic activities at the global level. International tax cooperation must be a part of a set of effective and well-coordinated multilateral, multilateral actions to respond to the crisis. And it's getting much easier today with the usage of advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence for effective financial data analytics. I want to thank to thank the exceptional lineup of our speakers today, who will participate in a very fruitful conversation and they will enlighten us about all the latest trends related to the international tax. I want to thank our sponsors, KPMG and Rilarakis and Associates, also our media sponsors, Naftiboriki, Naftiboriki.gr and Tax Heaven. Thank you all very much for your participation. I will now pass the digital mic to the chair of our superb tax committee, Mr. Stavros Costas, for his welcome remarks. Thank you very much, Elias. <clears throat> uh, on behalf of the Amsterdam Taxation Committee, I would like to welcome and express my sincere thanks to our distinguished interlocutors with excess knowledge on international economic and tax affairs for their participation in our second digital roundtable discussion under the umbrella of eTax Forum Sirius 2020. The subject of our discussion, under the coordination of the experienced lawyer, Mr. John Delarakis, will cover a timing diagnostic overview of the international tax cooperation movements in response to the painful consequences of the COVID-19 19 pandemic crisis. As Mr. Spirtunas pointed out a few moments ago, in the context of the particularly adverse implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and in due consideration of challenges resulting from the digitalization of the economies, countries and relevant international organizations or institutions such as EU Commission, OECD, United Nations, etc., have accordingly focused their interest to relevant priorities for action. Their attention and energy have been concentrated on the search of budgetary measures, emergency policies, and aid rules to address effectively the negative economic and social disruptions with, but with adequate flexibility, seeking at the same time open opportunities for moving decisively to sustainable and inclusive growth while addressing the unavoidable growing uncertainty, a factor multiply weakening the economies. Apart from strategic measures and policies aimed to reduce the loss effects to the enterprise and the productive potential, care has been taken to support vulnerable control institutions, 
such as the regulatory frame over cross-border transactions. Easing the parameter of compliance as a result of the lockdown, the risk lurks to weaken the rules for control in transparency, fairness, and correctness of cross-border transactions disclosure rules enacted at European and national level. For all these good reasons, the subject of today is very timing, is extremely critical and interesting to the extent it seeks to identify the right reflexes on the side of the public administration and the enterprises community for adaptability to the new conditions with necessary capitalization in the digital transformation in all its forms. On this basis, I anticipate and I wish that we will have an interactive and productive debate between our qualified speakers at the panel to follow. The bet seems to be obvious, but extremely important. Can international tax cooperation respond successfully to the COVID-19 crisis in a way to monitor and stimulate fair and participatory taxation regimes over economic activities. More importantly, to keep alive the strong vision for a sustainable green color and inclusive economy in a society, in a socially, socially fair way, despite the difficulties and the growing uncertainty at global and national level. As such, I hand over the speech step to the panel coordinator and distinguished Greek lawyer, Mr. Andrelarakis, wishing to all good continuation, good continuation and great success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce who assigned to me this task to coordinate the speeches of three distinguished speakers in a matter which is uh, under the circumstances very, very important to all the world. International tax considerations. We have three speakers uh, who are known experts in the field of the tax, internationally and nationally. Mrs. Katerina Savaidu is a lawyer specializing in the field of the tax law. She is an associate professor at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, holder of uh, Jean Monnet Chair, EU Tax Policy and Administration. But uh, she derives, she comes from the practice because uh, she has worked as a senior manager at uh, PwC, Greece. And uh, most importantly, she served as Secretary General for the Public Revenue, the Greek Tax and Customs Administration, ADE, as we call it in, in Greek, from June 2014 until October 2015. So we have a chance uh, to listen uh, to uh, an expert who is equally balanced between the practice and the theory. Uh, we also have the honor to have with us Mr. Pierce O'Reilly uh, from OECD. He is a tax economist in the OECD Center for Tax Policy and Administration. And I thank him very much for accepting our invitation to participate in this conference. His work focuses on personal and corporate income tax and international tax issues. He has recently been part of the team carrying out the impact assessment of the proposals to address the tax challenges of the digital economy. Digital economy. The new term we have to be accustomed with. He holds a PhD from Columbia University in New York and priorly he has joined, uh, before joining the OECD, he worked as a consultant on fiscal transparency issues for the World uh, Bank. Last but uh, not least, uh, we have Elia Bazi, a colleague, a lawyer, who is a manager also uh, in um, 
the Greek law firm of the KPMG network, specializing in European and public law, and especially in administrative and tax law. In specialized issues like the exchange of information and the administrative cooperation in the field of taxation, the compliance with the regulatory framework of anti-money laundering, as well as the transparency on ultimate beneficial owner, UBOs. I believe that I open your appetite with the description I made. And before losing any time, because we have to give them all ample time to finish their presentation to our benefit, I will give uh, uh, the speech to, to my friend, uh, Mrs. Katerina Savaidu, and I'm looking forward to, to listening to whatever wisdom he has, she has to transfer to us. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, Mr. Drilakis. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank the American Hellenic Chamber for the invitation to participate to the digital talk. And of course, uh, from my part, hello to everyone who have joined uh, this digital uh, meeting. So, um, as Mr. Rilakis has already said, our discussion today uh, concerns the fiscal and tax implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and the rescue measures taken to deal with its uh, economic consequences uh, caused by the dramatic but uh, of course uh, necessary measures uh, to contain the pandemic, especially the lockdown. Uh, although the, the, we have witnessed large variations between jurisdictions regarding the size of fiscal packages that have been taken in order to deal with this situation. Um, we see that uh, all, go all governments around the world have taken significant emergency tax and fiscal measures in order to, to tackle this uh, situation uh, in a common, on a common pattern. Uh, that means that uh, the priority was to contain the, the economic harm and of course to support uh, households and business in order to uh, help individuals preserve their, their economic capacity, at least a part of it, and of course uh, help business uh, preserve their cash flow. Of course we can understand that uh, the main fiscal response to this pandemic uh, is based on the national budget uh, of the states. So we see that uh, governments around the globe have taken a series of budgetary measures either on expenditure side or on revenue side. Uh, so we have seen uh, direct payments in order to support uh, households and business and of course a series of uh, tax expenditures like deferred payments uh, or additional time to file tax returns and other specific measures. So we have said that the main fiscal response uh, is the state budget. Uh, but of course, in the EU level, we can understand that uh, the measures taken should be in line with the EU uh, fiscal rules and of course, uh, EU state aid rules. So in order for the Commission to support member states in their fiscal interventions, uh, the, the Commission issued, right after the outbreak of the pandemic, a communication uh, on a coordinated response to address the economic impact uh, of, uh, of coronavirus. And of course, uh, to provide the flexibility uh, of the uh, European fiscal framework, flexibility of uh, state aid rules, uh, solidarity in the single market, and of course, uh, a mobilization of the European budget in order to have a, a, a really important, a really major recovery plan for the European states. Now, uh, just a few words for the two, first, uh, um, the two first measures. Regarding the flexibility of the European fiscal framework, the Council has adopted the Commission proposal for the activation of the General Escape Clause of the Stability and Growth Pact in order to allow Member States to undertake a series of measures to deal adequately with the crisis 
while departing from the budgetary requirements that normally would apply under the, the European fiscal framework. In the same direction, the Commission adopted a temporary framework of uh, state aid rules in order to help uh, European countries uh, to take uh, national funds uh, granted. Sorry, just to put it in full screen, if we can. I'm not sure that we can do it. So, um, in order to uh, help countries uh, immediately act through public uh, support measures uh, like uh, wage subsidies or suspension of payments of certain taxes or social contributions. And we have to say that by today, uh, the Commission has already approved uh, uh, several hundred billion of euros to support the, the European economies uh, and, of course, to face the coronavirus outbreak. Especially for Greece, uh, uh, Greece has taken advantage of this temporary framework and has already received uh, the Commission's approval for the repayable advance scheme for undertakings and also of other loan schemes in order to help certain sectors of the Greek economy. Now, regarding the, the tax measures in uh, EU jurisdictions, apart from the introduction of uh, VAT exemptions or other relief from uh, import duties granted to goods uh, needed to combat this, uh, this pandemic, I think that the most important was the, the adoption by the Council of an amendment to the Directive on Administrative Cooperation in the Tax Field, known as DAC6, that Mrs. Ambazi will uh, further talk later on. Uh, now, apart from the European level, we had also uh, certain interventions in the international level. Of course, we have said that it's uh, the states that take measures uh, through, the, through their budgets, but of course, international organizations like OECD, IMF, United Nations, and other society, civil society organizations uh, like uh, a global initiative for fiscal transparency have been very active in releasing policy papers regarding tax, tax and fiscal reforms in time of COVID. The OECD has also offered some guidelines to assist governments and uh, policymakers in order to take best decisions on the measures implemented in order to deal with these uh, economic pressures. So they have uh, published a series of papers for the health systems, the, the educational system, the tourist sector, the international trade, etc. But of course, in our field, uh, especially regarding tax and fiscal field, they have released uh, certain papers, uh, especially for emergency tax policy measures and tax administration measures, uh, an important paper uh, for the application and the interpretation of tax treaties, especially with cross-border workers and the questions related to uh, residents and also PE considerations. And of course, apart from uh, strictly census tax uh, uh, topics, uh, OECD has received very important papers regarding uh, local governments and the impact of COVID on their budget, uh, public debt management and public integrity, especially for uh, public administration and of course tax administration. So, um, OECD uh, mentioned a series of emergency tax policy responses that can be taken by different governments around the globe. So, we have seen uh, a series of measures like the extension of deadlines, the remittance of penalties or interest, the, the easier uh, access to debt payment plans and suspension of debt recovery measures, the simplification of procedures for refunds, the adjustment of advance tax payments. Apart for, uh, for these emergency tax measures, 
I think that, that uh, the work of OECD is very important in the field of uh, public debt management, uh, especially uh, the consideration about the, the challenges uh, posed for public debt management offices uh, due to the increased borrowing needs and the mismatches in uh, cash flow uh, for the national budgets. And in this framework, the OECD has um, underlined the role of the independent fiscal institutions. I mean, the, the independent um, fiscal councils or other uh, budget offices. So their role is very important because they can give uh, the, the picture of the, of the fiscal stance uh, in promoting fiscal transparency and accountability and also um, uh, reaching uh, certain solutions in order to help decision makers uh, in their decisions about uh, tax and fiscal reforms. Uh, at the end, I, I would like to emphasize on the, on the risks, um, uh, especially for public administrations, uh, for fraud and corruption, uh, and, the, and the checks and audits that has been to, to be taken by public administration and tax administration. So we have seen that uh, the response uh, is in three levels, the national level, through the state budget, the European, the European Union level, with all the intervention of uh, the European institutions, and of course, the help provided by the international organizations through their uh, policy papers. At the end, uh, I would like to say that all of this, uh, this unprecedented situation has highlighted the, the need for the coordination of the national authorities, the European institutions, the international organizations, in order to effectively restrict the economic crisis, uh, to establish fair fiscal tax policies towards the sustainable and inclusive growth, and of course, uh, help uh, attain all the sustainable development goals that uh, they are provided by the United Nations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina. It was an excellent presentation. We are living in uh, unprecedented circumstances. Uh, actually, it's uh, since uh, 1928 that uh, the Earth has not seen a pandemic situation. Now we have to live with it. It's an invisible enemy. Uh, who invades uh, to our homes everywhere and we have to live with it uh, and cope with it. And thank you for uh, the complete presentation despite of the uh, shortage of uh, time. Uh, Pierce, it's uh, your time and we are very glad uh, to have you here today because uh, you will uh, explain, we have already heard uh, about OECD, but uh, now we will hear it from the horse's mouth uh, and we'll see the contribution of OECD in uh, coordinating and helping uh, the nations for coping with these uh, circumstances, because we cannot live anymore with the standards we have in the past. Now we have to use other tools in order to cope with it. Thank you very much. You, you have to, to open your, your microphone. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me first uh, thank the organizers for the invitation and say that it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be able to uh, discuss with you and uh, share some, uh, some thoughts from the OECD side on these important issues. So what I will try to do today in this short presentation is give an overview of the work that the OECD is doing to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. And of course, this is an important international agenda. Um, and also it's, it's work that very much affects uh, multinational businesses, but also is a key part of uh, the overall uh, economic policy climate uh, in these uh, difficult times. 
So I'll start by giving an overview of the uh, OECD uh, work that has been uh, undertaken over the past two years to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, to address the remaining BEPS risks, and to update the international tax system uh, to deal with the changing economy that we have. So we have followed this work uh, under two pillars, and I will briefly speak about them both. Pillar one is uh, based around uh, trying to address the taxation of, of the digital economy to update nexus and profit allocation rules um, to re reflect the, the new realities of, uh, of business models today. And under this pillar, the OECD has forwarded uh, a proposal by the OECD Secretariat for a unified approach. Um, and this, as part of this unified approach, we contemplate uh, new nexus rules and new profit allocation rules. So under the, the umbrella of new nexus rules, um, an important new departure of the, the unified approach is that new nexus rules would be uh, implemented in the international tax system that would be unconstrained by physical presence. And this is a key way in which we're responding to the tax challenges of digitalization uh, by giving market jurisdictions where digital companies are doing business uh, a new taxing right that's unconstrained by whether uh, a digital m and &E or another kind of an M&E does physical businesses in the country. We're, we're reacting and, and updating the rules to reflect the digitalization of the economy. The second key part of, of the unified approach is new profit allocation rules. And here we have forwarded uh, the idea of, of three amounts um, through which uh, market jurisdictions where sales are taking place would be remunerated under a potential new system. So amount A of, of the new approach, the unified approach, is probably the part of this overall process that has attracted most attention from business and most attention uh, from the press. And under amount A, what we contemplate is that a portion of uh, MEs, what we refer to as deemed residual profit, would be uh, taxable in the market jurisdiction under a new taxing right. So this would operate separately and independently of the existing uh, arm's length principle. And the way it would work is that uh, for MEs that were in scope of amount A, and the scope is still uh, the subject of, of an ongoing debate, um, but for MEs that were in scope, uh, larger MEs, MEs above a size threshold, that were very profitable and were therefore deemed to be earning residual profits, non-routine profits. Um, part of those non-routine profits would be allocated to market jurisdictions who would then have taxing rights over those, uh, those profits. And so this is an important new departure uh, in terms of the international tax system. Uh, and it's significant in several ways. First of all, for the purposes of amount A, you know, large MEs would be uh, dealt with on a consolidated basis. So we would be looking at the m and profits as a whole or on a business line basis, but it's a departure from the, the separate entity principle uh, that has dominated the international tax system up to now. So that's first. Second is the new nexus rule, unconstrained by physical presence, as I mentioned. And third is we contemplate the implementation of a mandate through a lot of simplified formulas. So rather than uh, much of the existing transfer pricing system, we'd be taking advantage of uh, uh, simplifying measures to streamline the application of a mandate to allocate residual profits to market jurisdiction using simplified formulas that will make this easier for MEs and for governance uh, to administer. The second amount, uh, as part of the new profit allocation rules that are under discussion at the inclusive framework at the moment, is amount B. And under amount B, we contemplate a fixed return. Uh, for distribution functions in market jurisdictions. And the goal here is not to uh, provide a new taxing right like we provide in amount A, but rather to streamline the application of the arm plank principle in cases where uh, the, the activities or functions being undertaken in the market are routine functions, and amount B would contemplate a fixed return for those routine functions that would allow jurisdictions uh, to 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 uh, understand their taxing rights and it needs to understand that their 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 taxes paid uh, in a way that's simplified and streamlined as a result of, of of fixed returns being applied. And then finally, the remaining way in which profits would be allocated would be under traditional TP analysis, which we refer to as an as as a MANC. But under a MANC, uh, under the proposal new and strengthened dispute resolution and dispute prevention procedures be put in place to raise tax certainty and to reduce disputes 
and make the system uh, more streamlined and more applicable and to provide more tax certainty for both businesses and uh, for tax administrations. So that's pillar one. Next, I'll discuss pillar two. Um, pillar two is also known as the, the GLOBE, the Global Anti-Base Erosion Proposal. And unlike uh, pillar one, which is trying to deal with the tax challenges of digitalization and update the tax system to reflect new business models, pillar two has a slightly different focus where it's trying to deal with the remaining BEPS issues that are left over from the BEPS project, which concluded several years ago. And here we're trying to address the continuing ability for MNEs to put systems in place whereby certain MNEs pay low or zero rates of taxation. And so under the scope of this overall global anti-base erosion proposal, we look at four different rules and you see them there on the slide. And uh, I'll say to begin with that, um, you know, the no part, no individual rule as part of this proposal is, is you know, more important or better than any, any other part. These rules work together and uh, a, a key part of, of the GLOBE proposal is to put in place rule coordination uh, uh, measures so that the rules interact well, the rules are well ordered and the rules interact properly with the existing tax system. So just to speak briefly about each of the rules, and I should say that a lot more information about the way this work is contained in you know, a variety of publications and webcasts that are on the OECD website. But first, we'll talk about the income inclusion rule. What the income inclusion rule does is that it operates in a similar way to CFC rules in the sense that it gives a residence jurisdiction an additional taxing right in the cases where uh, an entity belonging to, to an m and &E in that jurisdiction uh, is paying uh, low or, or not enough rate of tax that uh, an income inclusion rule would apply such that the, the jurisdiction of the parent would have an additional top-up taxing right over that low taxed income. And so that's a key part of the, the GLOBE and a key way in which um, uh, the GLOBE would work to ensure that m and are paying a minimum level of taxation uh, on their activities globally. A second key rule is the under tax payments rule. This rule would give jurisdictions um, the right to levy a tax on payments where that payment was going through a jurisdiction with a low or, or, or zero tax rate or where uh, the result of that payment would be uh, that uh, that income or that payment would be subject to low or, or minimum taxation. Um, next is a, a subject to tax rule. This rule would apply on, on largely in, in kind of a bilateral framework. And what it would do, it would, it would provide the opportunity for uh, jurisdictions where provisions of a tax treaty give rise to low or minimum levels of taxation to essentially, again, apply a top-up tax to bring the level of taxation being applied to that m and &E or to that transaction up to a global minimum rate. And finally, a switchover rule. And what this rule would do would ensure the application of the income inclusion rule in cases where, because of a treaty or because of another provision, a branch of an m and &E in a foreign jurisdiction was exempt from taxation. So again, you'd be looking at a situation where top-up taxation would be applied to bring the overall amount that an m and &E is paying uh, up to a minimum rate. Now, there's a lot of technical work being done around these proposals, both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and there's a lot of uh, you know, various issues that are being resolved or that remain unresolved and, and subject to, to, uh, to debate and discussion. So for example, on Pillar 1, the scope of Pillar 1 is not finalized, you know, the nature of the accounting, uh, the, the uh, various thresholds and amounts that would be used to implement the proposals, the precise details of the tax certainty system, et cetera, et cetera, all is part of the, the package that is uh, the subject of ongoing work. With regard to Pillar 2, um, you know, the details of the rule order, the details of the application of the various rules, the sectors in scope, all of that is being subject uh, to ongoing work and ongoing discussion by uh, the Inclusive Framework member jurisdictions supported by ourselves in the OECD Secretariat. I'll mention um, as well, and it's the subject of the next slide, is that all of this work is being uh, supported by economic analysis and impact assessment to help member jurisdictions understand the impacts of the various choices that they're making so that every country knows what the, uh, the implications of the, the implementation of these various provisions on their own revenue and also on investment and growth, which is very important in, in the current climate. So to speak a little bit more about this impact assessment, we hope to release more information on the, the overall impact of these proposals on revenue and on investment later this year. But to give an overview of preliminary results, 
what we expect is that the combined application of pillars one and two will generate substantial global net revenue gains. So there will be new money for governments from the implementation of these proposals. We also expect the proposals to lead to a significant reduction in profit shifting. And you know, the logic behind that is that the implementation of a global minimum tax will uh, reduce m and incentives to engage in profit shifting because the, the, whether you do the profit shifting or not, uh, the application of the global minimum tax on top of that um, will, will, will reduce um, the, the value gained for m and by, by engaging in profit shifting and should improve uh, and support uh, the, the, the global tax framework overall. Um, we're doing a lot of ongoing work in terms of the impact assessment. The way we've uh, done this is by sending uh, country-specific information to each member jurisdiction saying, this is how we think the proposals will impact you based on various scenarios and giving countries the flexibility to understand how various choices will impact the revenues for them. Because as I've said, there's still a lot uh, up for discussion and up for, up for uh, uh, debate by the inclusive framework member jurisdictions. So we're supporting them in terms of um, trying to, to understand how different choices that they may make will impact revenue, investment and growth and so on. Of course, this is uh, you know a very large and 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 you know in many ways quite complex uh, set of new rules and new systems, and so it's important to consider what the impacts of these will be. But it's important that we consider uh, the impact of the implementation of these proposals not with reference to the world as it is now, but what the world uh, could look like if uh, at the inclusive framework we don't reach a consensus on a way forward to address these various issues. And one of the things that we've uh, uh, been doing analysis of is what the impact of what we call the counterfactual scenario um, if a consensus-based solution is not achieved. And what we mean there is that, you know, for some of these large m and in the absence of a consensus-based solution being achieved as part of these negotiations, countries may act unilaterally. And we're seeing a lot of that happening already. Um, and the impact of that unilateral action, we argue, is negative for a series of reasons. First, it reduces the coherence of the international tax system. Um, different countries implement different unilateral measures. It makes it harder for businesses to comply with and increases the amount of disputes and tax uncertainty that businesses have to face relative to uh, a unified uh, solution achieved at the inclusive framework, which will uh, increase the coherence and increase the level of certainty available to businesses. But we also say that you know the the, the absence of consensus uh, at the inclusive framework will will um, potentially lead to uh, increased tax disputes uh, between countries and you know potentially give rise to to tax retaliation and trade retaliation between member jurisdictions, um, which you know is something that we've already seen uh, in the in the public debate. Another area of ongoing work in terms of the impact assessment is trying to consider the impact of the COVID nineteen crisis on all of this work. Um, you know, this work began before uh, COVID-19 was, was, was such a feature, um, but we're trying to reconsider, well, what does the, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis mean for um, uh, the impact of these proposals, mean for the revenue of these proposals, and mean for the, for the design of these proposals? And so just to, to briefly go into that in, in more detail, we think that the uh, presence of the, the COVID-19 crisis makes it more important than ever to achieve a solution to these many issues. First of all, as I mentioned, you know, in the absence of a solution, we're seeing more risks of countries taking unilateral action, counter-retaliation, etc., um, that may result in you know, uh, an increasingly difficult and, and, and conflictual international tax environment. And this is something that we, we argue the, the global economy can, can little afford given the, the, the current downturn and the current difficulties that many governments are facing. Second, um, you know, governments are facing significant fiscal challenges, as, as my colleagues mentioned earlier on. And so it's more important than ever to make sure that the tax system uh, is being implemented, revenues being uh, raised in a fair way uh, and in a sustainable way. And that's, again, why we think that it's very important to achieve uh, a solution to this work. There's a reduced tolerance for tax avoidance. You know, many uh, businesses have benefited from substantial fiscal support from governments over the course of this crisis and continue to do so. And that's that's right and that's good. Um, but it also means that we think that there will be reduced tolerance for tax avoidance by M&E and that makes it more important to ensure that everyone is paying uh, a minimum level of tax.
And finally, you know, a reason why it's it's uh, especially important to address these digital issues is that digitalization is becoming more important. And we think that COVID-19 has really accelerated that. Like we can all see uh, and notice the, the increased importance of digital technologies with the increased use of teleworking. Uh, and that will be even more important going forward. And that means again, that addressing these digital issues it is ever more important. However, um, also the, the COVID-19 crisis has made it difficult for us to, to continue this work. Um, delegates are to our uh, inclusive framework meetings uh, at the technical level where we're trying to move this process forward are less available because you know, there's a lot of constraints um, and everybody's facing very, very difficult circumstances at home. Um, in addition, all of our meetings have had to, have had to, to move uh, online. And so that has uh, definitely slowed a lot of the process down. But um, we're still working and uh, we're still very focused on achieving a solution. And we think that uh, an enormous amount of, of, of progress has been made. And we think that by the end of the year, we'll be able to, to uh, point the way towards a solution and hopefully provide that level of, of, of tax certainty to businesses and also uh, provide uh, the members of the inclusive framework with uh, a, a solution that they, they can support and can move forward uh, on the basis of. Uh, so I'll stop there, but I'm uh, very happy to to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Pierce. It was uh, a, a very interesting presentation. OECD has shown that uh, it can help uh, without having any powers in his hands, uh, only by persuasion and producing proposals uh, which fit uh, all the parties concerned. So we rely on uh, this assistance, uh, which will be very helpful under the circumstances. I understand we have a technical problem for the next speaker, but um, I think that um, I will try uh, to work with some questions that uh, we have. Uh, Pierce, starting from you, um, I, I want to your your uh, view on what will happen uh, the tax uh, the taxation rules will be changed but uh, what the change will be will be it for a few digital companies or the intention is to make broad changes which will affect all the companies with digitalized business models what will happen uh, what uh, you see to take place yeah, thank you very much. It's a it, it's a good question. I mean, I think where the 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 question you ask gets to what we call the scope of the proposals, and this is basically which kinds of MEs will be in scope, which kinds of MEs will be affected by the proposals, and that's uh, a topic that is uh, very much still under negotiation uh, by the inclusive framework member countries, and it's still part of the discussion. And so, you know, uh, all of this ha has that caveat that, you know, no final conclusions have been reached on this. But I think I can say several things. First of all, you know, we want we do want to address these tax challenges, but we're conscious as well that, you know, uh, the compliance costs of, of these proposals are going to be large. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to balance the level of compliance for businesses uh, against the, the scale of the problem and then also the scale of the, the revenues that can be raised. So I think as part of that, um, the you know part of the proposals would be to exempt uh, you know small and medium-sized businesses from the application of these proposals to make sure they're focused on uh, the largest businesses, the businesses that are most profitable um, and the businesses that have a, a significant uh, global footprint. I think I should say as well, you know, the proposals are not at all kind uh, confined to digital businesses. I think, um, you know, certainly in terms of amount A, uh, the unified approach that was released by the OECD contemplated not just the application to, uh, you know, very digitalized businesses, but also to other businesses that uh, have intangibles that you know, do impact profit and they're engaged in the markets of consumer facing businesses that may not be digital. In addition, then, you know, uh, deals with quite a different set of issues. So that's an, an important other part of the package. But the scope of Pillar 2 doesn't uh, necessarily confine itself to, to digitalized businesses alone, but rather tries to deal with a separate set of issues around you know, low or minimal levels of taxation, regardless of the, the specific sector that a business happens to be operating in. So I think the overall message there is, yes, the, there is a, a key issue in terms of physical presence and digital businesses. 
yes, we also need to make sure that you know uh, small and medium sized enterprises that you know cannot deal with this uh, that the compliance costs are exempt, but also to make sure that we're um, you know uh, properly addressing the issues that are faced uh, in terms of the broader economy. And that's something that we're doing as part of MMP, um, providing fixed returns for uh, routine distribution activities. That's definitely applied uh, outside the digital sector. Amount C, in terms of strength and tax certainty, that goes beyond the digital sector. And then also pillar two, focused on uh, a minimum level of taxation that will be applied much more broadly. So there is a focus on digital, but uh, I think the proposals also contemplate um, a, a broader scope for some of these measures as well. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Bazi is back, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, before uh, going there, let me put a second question and we'll finish with that. Uh, um, uh, how do you see the whole process? Uh, should the OECD project, uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar, pillar 2, uh, be postponed due to the uh, virus or will be expedited? What, what is the most uh, probable thing? Yeah, it's 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 a good question, and it's uh, we're you know we're still very much in a in a uh, a very intense phase of work. Um, the work has been made more difficult uh, because of the the COVID nineteen crisis. And that's just a, a fact of life in terms of the inability of, of delegates to travel to Paris for these discussions. Um, you know that slows down all of the important technical work that we need to do. I think there's also, you know, uh, uh, a challenge in terms of delegates' attention. Uh, many delegates are facing very, very difficult fiscal conditions that they need to focus on, and that slowed down a lot of the work. Having said that, um, you know, the the message that we've received uh, from from the G20 and from the inclusive framework is move forward. Uh, we need these issues to be solved. Um, if anything, the the, the need to solve them. Um, has been, you know, is, is more urgent as a result of the crisis. So we're still working and we're still trying to push forward. In terms of the timeline, you know, we had uh, originally been set a deadline of, of uh, end of 2020 um, to, to reach an agreement. It may not be possible to reach a final agreement by the end of 2020, but we think certainly on some aspects of this, we will be able to reach an agreement and where we can't, we'll be able to demonstrate substantial progress that points the way towards an agreement and shows where the consensus exists and, and shows the body of technical work that has been done so that you know if the if the, the work needs to continue, um, it can continue on with a very, very solid foundation. Thank you very much, Pierce. It's good to always to hear from the horse's mouth uh, the information. Um, I welcome uh, Mrs. Sabadzi back. Uh, and uh, we are very keen uh, to hear uh, your presentation. Uh, sorry for what happened, but it's uh, good that you're back. So we are all ears. Thank you, Mr. Lirakis. Thank you, Mr. Lirakis. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm facing some could work fine from now on. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to present you the new mandatory disclosure rules, which actually have come into force since last week, from 1st of July. Today, we will see together the basic requirements of the new rules, and we will also have a look on the recent updates regarding the deferral, which the Council of the European Union adopted in terms of facing the severe disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we could proceed with the first slide or the second slide of the presentation. Uh, and let me begin with the background and some highlights of the new rules. In light of the re revelations of the LuxLeaks and the Panama Papers, the European Union decided to introduce new transparency requirements for the so called. All intermediaries, which are uh, those rules. Uh, in this respect, on June 2018, the Council published a new directive, which is actually the sixth amendment of the Directive on Administrative Cooperation, and therefore is commonly known as DAC 6. The DAC 6 introduces an obligation to disclose potentially aggressive tax planning arrangements to the tax authorities, 
namely <coughs> arrangements that may lead to tax avoidance or tax evasion. Uh, besides the fact that some transactional structures could be used for genuine reasons, the new rules were introduced in order to provide the tax authorities with information so as to enable them to promptly react uh, against harmful tax practices when they occur, uh, and also enable the member states to track and close loopholes by enacting uh, legislation. Uh, in this context, it was considered that it would be much better if the information could reach the tax authorities uh, at, an early, at an early stage and by those persons who advise or assist in the arrangement, the so-called intermediaries. Uh, however, furthermore, though, in cases where the taxpayer designs or implements a scheme in-house, the information should not be lost. And consequently, the new rules also provide that in such circumstances, the taxpayer himself will need to report to the tax authorities. Uh, the DAC6 also provides the means to the tax authorities to exchange standardized information via central EU directory. The new rules apply to all taxes, or all taxes of any kind, with a very few exceptions, such as the value added in tax. Uh, according to the directive, only the cross border arrangements must, must be disclosed, namely the arrangements that concern one. Uh, more than one uh, EU member state or a member state that on third country, third country. However, not all cross-border transactions must be disclosed. In order for a arrangement to be reportable, at least one of the so-called hallmarks should be met. These hallmarks are specifically defined in the directive and they are essentially features and elements that may indicate tax avoidance or abuse. Uh, the tax provides for multiple generic and specific hallmarks, which uh, require a close examination and the assessment of the arrangement in an ad hoc basis. In principle, there are two kinds of uh, hallmarks, two basic kinds of hallmarks. On the one hand, we have those that, if they cure, they lead directly to reporting obligation. And on the other hand, we have those uh, hallmarks that are linked with the so called main benefit test, meaning that in order for an arrangement to be reportable, an additional test should be fulfilled, which would end to the, to, to the fact that the main benefit or one of the main benefits of the arrangement is the obtaining of a tax advantage. Uh, the information must be reported within a really short deadline of 30 days, uh, which begins uh, either from the day after the arrangement is made available for implementation, or is ready for implementation, or when the first step in implementation has been made, whichever occurs first. However, uh, the directive introduces also a retrospective reporting obligation for those arrangements, the first step of which was implemented between the date of entry into force and the date of application of the directive, namely between June 2018 and June 2020. In the next slide, we can see, uh, we could see uh, the reporting, uh, who bears the reporting obligation. Primary reporting obligation lies with the intermediaries. A, a person, either legal entity or individual, qualifies as an intermediary when is resident or established in the European Union and designs, markets, organizes, makes available for implementation or manages the implementation of a reportable arrangement. But also, intermediaries can be the persons that know or could be reasonably expected to know that they provide aid, assistance, or advice with respect to a reportable arrangement. Even in case of multiple intermediaries involved, in principle, each one is responsible to report unless he has proof that the same information has been filed by another intermediary in another member state. Uh, it should be noted that the directive gives the, gives the right to the member states to adopt a waiver for intermediaries in case the reporting obligation would breed the legal professional privilege under their national law. This waiver rests at the discretion of member states and as a result, we can see several vari local variations in the implementation within the EU. In any case, though, 
when there is a waiver for the intermediary or if there is no intermediary at all, namely because the arrangement is developed in-house, the reporting obligation still remains and lies with the relevant taxpayer, uh, who can be only exempt from reporting only if he has proof that the same information has been filed in another member state. Uh, in the next slide, we could, uh, let's say, two examples for better understanding all of our methods. Uh, in this first example, assuming, let's assume that the group company contributes cash to its foreign subsidy. Then the foreign subsidy gives out a loan to its parent company, which subsequently deducts the interest expenses from its taxable income. Assuming also that this arrangement has been developed in-house and there is no intermediary involved. Uh, assessing this series of transactions, we could probably conclude that they offset and cancel each other, uh, which is actually an indication that falls in the scope of hallmark B3 of the directive. However, the fact of the circular transactions cannot let alone the reportable arrangement, since this specific hallmark is also linked with the main benefit tax. Consequently, it should be also examined whether the main benefit or one of the main benefits of the arrangement is the obtaining of a tax advantage. In this scenario, main benefit test could be likely deemed fulfilled if the refinancing is motivated by tax users or if, in fact, the tax advantage occurs as a result of the transaction. If so, this conclusion would lead to a reportable cross-border arrangement, which should be disclosed by the taxpayer himself since it is developed in house and there is no intermediary involved. In the next slide, we can see a different scenario. Uh, let's uh, assume uh, that a member of an international group makes a tax deductible payment to an affiliate which is resident in a blacklisted country, let's say in the US Virgin Islands. Uh, as blacklisting countries, we mean the, those that are. Uh, uh, belong to a, a blacklist according to the OCD or the EU or the national uh, uh, legislation. This transaction falls under another hallmark of the directive for which the meaning benefit test is not relevant, meaning that the transaction directly leads to a reporting obligation without the need to examine further factors. Assuming now that the intermediary, uh, that an intermediary is involved, uh, even not uh, by designing the arrangement, arrangement but uh, by providing assistance in making it available for implementation. The disclosure should be made by the intermediary and not the taxpayer. In the next slide, uh, now we have summarized the rules and let's see the reporting deadlines uh, and some updates on the recent deferral decided within the EU. Tax 6 entered into force on the 5th, 25th of June 2018 with a late low application day, namely the new rules are applicable as of the 1st July 2020. Member states were required to adopt and publish equivalent legislation until uh, 31st of December 2018. In terms of state of play, uh, today, 22 countries have completed the transposition process. Five countries are in the process of approving legislation, and there is still Greece, where draft, draft bill, unfortunately, has not been published yet. Uh, due to the coronavirus situation, which caused severe delays and distractions, uh, and since the application date of the directive was coming soon on 1st of July, uh, the Council of the European Union ad adopted an amendment allowing member states an option to defer the deporting, uh, reporting deadlines of the new rules up to six months. The deferral is optional, meaning that the member states will need to make a choice whether to opt for deferral or, or not. In this respect, the reporting deadlines are going to be different for most member states but the initial time, uh, timeline, which we see now here, uh, will be still relevant because some countries uh, will not uh, opt for the deferral. Uh, and that, uh, an example for this is Finland. Uh, according to the original time, as we, see here, as we see here, reportable arrangements should be disclosed within 30 days, starting from 1st of July, uh, which is the application date. 
for retrospective reporting of historical arrangements, uh, and by which I mean those uh, which, uh, for which the first step in implementation was made between June 2018 and June 2020. The deadline is at the end of August 2020, and uh, uh, finally the deadline for the tax authorities to exchange information uh, is originally at the end of October, this October. In the next slide, uh, based on the deferral option, uh, we come in with a new timeline, timeline uh, looking much better than the original one, I have to say. Uh, just a reminder, this timeline will only apply for those countries that opt the deferral and choose uh, the full six months, uh, the full six months, because the amended directive does allow postponement for up to six months. Uh, so in principle, at least, member states opt for anything between zero and six months. Uh, but assuming a six-month deferral, the 1st of, of July application date remains. However, reporting deadlines will be firmed by a maximum of six months, which means that the clock for the 30-day uh, deadline will start ticking on 1st January 2021st, uh, instead of last week, uh, 1st of July. Uh, this means that the first reporting deadline would actually be January 31st, um, 2021, uh, and this deadline will apply for all new arrangements during the deferral period, uh, meaning uh, between 1st of July and December 31st. Whereas the historical arrangement, namely those for which uh, the first step in implementation was made between June uh, 2018 and June 2020, the deadline uh, for the retrospective reporting will be posed to uh, 28 February 2021, instead of the end of this August. And finally, the first periodic exchange between the tax authorities would be uh, on uh, 30 April 2021. So this is the maximum deferred date, let's say, uh, under the full six-month deferral. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, uh, we can see that on uh, by the moment, we have already seen official announcements uh, from several countries that have confirmed the full six-month deferral. Uh, some other countries have still have not yet officially communicated their position, and we still expect for the, expecting for this. Uh, there is one country, Austria, who has opted uh, for a three-month deferral, uh, whereas Finland announced that will stick to the original timeline, not opting for a deferral. Finally, there is a group of countries, including Greece, uh, where implementation has been not completed yet, and consequently the deferral seems to be inevitable. Uh, but again, this uh, hasn't been publicly announced yet, so figure cro fingers crossed uh, there won't be any unpleasant surprises in the coming days. So just to be clear, the reasons for the deferral are obvious, obviously COVID-19, uh, and the practical difficulties, the difficulties caused, and obviously this is not a general deferral of obligations. The obligations have entered into force since 1st of July. This is only an option for deferral of the reporting deadlines, and therefore, intermediates and taxpayers will still need to be able to track and assess transactions over the deferral period, and of course, the retroactive period, uh, in order to be a compliant and report uh, transactions on the deferred days. So intermediaries and taxpayers need to be alert, well prepared, and very careful of what happens after uh, 1st of July. And with this having in our minds, I would like to close for now since the time constraints. And besides the complexity, I hope you have now have an idea of what the new rules are and how the new framework has been affected by the unexpected coronavirus situation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Sabadezi. It was an excellent presentation, especially the last uh, map, which was so representative of, of what goes on. And we all understand the duck had nothing to do with the famous Disney's uh, Donald Duck. <laughs> it's just the details of uh, the Directive on Administration Cooperation. Let's see whether this cooperation will take some priority 
in uh, the current environment or whether due to the current environment it will delay. Actually, it depends on what can be produced because if it's something which can produce additional income for the government, maybe they have an initiative to take care of that. Um, Thanks. If, uh, if uh, uh, I may uh, ask a question um, to Katerina, may I? Of course. I, Katerina, I was thinking, I was wondering, uh, this 700 billion uh, assistance, um, what will be the source of this uh, exceptionally high assistance, which will be distributed among the countries? How will it be gathered to be given? New taxes? Sorry? New taxes? Or... New taxes. Mm. Yes, uh, Mr. Spertunias Elias has already talked about that a little bit. Um, but it is true that the, the huge fall uh, uh, in tax revenues uh, as a result of the decline of the economic activity uh, the tax advantages uh, given during the, the first uh, phases of the crisis uh, have raised some questions about the, the possibility of uh, exceptional or even more uh, permanent uh, tax measures in order to finance um, this fiscal gap uh, and also to finance uh, all this money uh, coming from the, the European budget. Um, so, we have uh, different propositions from the theory, from uh, the academics, uh, even from politicians that said that uh, maybe um, a solution would be the introduction of new taxes to raise revenues and to finance the, the national budgets, or uh, maybe uh, an adjustment, an amendment to the, to the tax mix of the, of the existing uh, tax systems in order to, to raise, to increase their uh, progressiveness. Um, so we have some propositions about, um, uh, for example, some solidarity taxes to be imposed, uh, like um, uh, times after uh, wars or severe uh, financial or fiscal crisis. Um, some others talk about uh, taxing carbon in order to, let's say, combining um, different objectives of raising money and also make a, a long-term uh, uh, structural reform. And uh, this is for the national budget, but of course we have also propositions in the European level where there are some uh, economists that say that uh, maybe in order for the European Union to show uh, it, it's the it's solidarity, maybe we should have a, a European wealth tax for the more uh, rich European uh, um, people uh, who, who have the, let's say, the 20 to 25 percent of the, of the wealth in Europe. So, uh, this, uh, this is a proposition. Of course, there are uh, legal uh, questions about the possibility to raise such taxes, but I don't think that uh, we can discuss not, uh, now uh, this question. And in any case, I think that it is uh, it's a little bit early to uh, to decide about the uh, the fiscal or tax reforms that we have to do in the long term because we don't really know the exact size of the of the impact on the on the tax revenues and on the GDP. Um, we see that we have very different um, uh, insights from the. Uh, from the organizations, the international organizations, about the, the impact on the, on the European and the international economy. But in any case, I think that it is something that we have discussed because uh, we have to, to put the topic in the, in the public discussion uh, in order uh, to avoid new taxes in the, in the future, uh, to try to find another uh, ways of finance, and if we have to uh, find such a solution in the taxation system, 
maybe we should consider to, uh, let's say, to attract uh, wealth uh, in the national systems. For example, in Greece, we have a, the, 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 prov the provisions about the alternative uh, taxation of uh, foreigners in Greece. Uh, there is uh, the open discussion about the, the technological parks uh, and all this discussion about uh, R&Ds. And, and of course, um, Mr. O'Reilly uh, already uh, gave us the, the international uh, aspect um, of the international cooperation, uh, the need for the m and to, to pay a minimum uh, uh, level of tax, uh, and of course, uh, it is uh, it is real that uh, we should uh, collaborate more and find solutions in order to avoid uh, task uh, disputes in the future, or at least minimize uh, minimize these disputes by uh, prevention mechanism and by improving the dispute res resolution system. So I think it's uh, the debate is open. Let's see what the you know the the policymakers will decide in order to finance the the national budgets and of course the the European budget. Gold save us. That's a wish. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, have we time for a last question? Uh, <clears throat> well, the time. Uh... If you have something else, let's do it. Yes, Otherwise... I have a question, a question for uh, Mrs. Right. Um, okay. We saw different approach from uh, all the countries within the European Union. Um, how you would you describe these differences in, in policy makers? How do they... What's the... The reason for this differentiation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lerakis. This is a very interesting issue, actually. Uh, first, uh, we should have in mind that the directive provides for the minimum requirements, and the rules need to be further implemented by the member states according to their discretion. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no official guidance from the European Commission uh, the implementation of the rules. So, uh, we, uh, as, a, uh, as a result, we see, uh, we have seen, already seen uh, local variations among the member states. Uh, first of all, we have seen two ways of domestic implementation. Some countries have chosen for a vanilla implementation, which means that there are no significant changes compared to the text of the directive, uh, whereas there are other countries that have significantly expanded the scope, including domestic arrangements and additional taxes, uh, probably because they want to, to cut more information. Uh, also, regarding the adoption of the waiver for legal professional privileges, we see differences. Uh, most member states uphold this privilege only for lawyers, while we see Whereas we see other member states that extend the scope to cover also other professionals that as tax advisors. Uh, we also see variations regarding the interpretation of the hallmarks and the concept of the tax advantage. It should be noted that a uh, few countries where the transposition process is completed have issued guidance in their, in their legislation, but most of the countries uh, in most of the, the countries, there are no official guidelines, so, so it, uh, it, it, the resulting, uh, it is the result of the um, uh, inevitable result of the, the, mis the misinterpretation. Uh, we also expect that there will be differences regarding the reporting procedure and the reporting schema, because uh, uh, in most of the countries it is not finalized yet. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we the, uh, we see uh, big differences is, uh, regarding the penalties. The directive explicitly provides for penalties, though uh, the uh, rest to it, it is rest to the discretion of the, its member states to define what kind and um, uh, uh, with what kind of penalties will be imposed. Uh, we can see significant differences on the penalties for the non-compliance. We see variations on the type of failures which trigger the penalties. Uh, and we see variations on the range of the maximum penalties imposed, which in some countries may amount to more than 1.5 million euros. 
um, having all these local variations in mind, it seems that the implementation of the new rules will be a tricky situation. And intermediaries and taxpayers, especially those belonging in multinational groups, will face the challenge of different implementation across Europe. Uh, and may should consider consult each jurisdiction and have in place a system to monitor and that fully report the uh, transactions. We could talk hours, but I think uh, that would be sufficient by the moment. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that we came to the end. Uh, I want uh, to thank uh, again the, uh, the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce and you personally, but also the speakers uh, who gave us the opportunity to visit all these interesting issues in uh, uh, the unprecedented situation we are coping with. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, <coughs> all I the have best. To, uh, gladly, we have reached the end. It was a successful, constructive, and uh, informative session to the, ex to the excellent, thorough, and meaningful presentations on the side of the panel participation, participants. With regards to the ongoing uh, considerations of impact of the COVID-19 crisis, I think a clear message was addressed to multiple stakeholders primarily also in the Greek uh, administrative and political leadership. The COVID-19 uh, crisis can be more efficiently treated through international tax cooperation by way of monitoring and stimulating a fair, equitable and participatory taxation regime over economic activities uh, capitalizing with increased strategic care on the emerging digitalization challenges. The post-pandemic direct <clears throat> disruptions need, of course, international coordination, coordinated action, especially so in due consideration of the OECD uh, advices. Needs also good reflexes, strong residents, adaptability, flexibility, and ability to handle the unavoidable COVID uncertainty at global and national level. At this point, I want to express many thanks to Mr. O'Reilly for his uh, presentation, uh, while he virtually gazing us from miles away from Brussels. Professor Ekaterini Savaidu, Ms. Elia Badzi from KPNG, and of course, Mr. John Drillerakis from Drillerakis Law Firm. Primarily, I want also to express thanks to the kind sponsors, Drillerakis Legal Firm and KPNG, the media partners, Naftaboriki, and of course, so that we don't forget it, the technical team who have made the teleconference workable without unforeseen functional interruptions. And last but not least of importance, the two dear ladies from the backstage of the digital meeting for their work to organize this meeting. Mrs. Liana Lepida of the Dileraki Group, and of course, Ms. Katerina Zagarulaki, the active and tireless coordinator of our taxation committee. Thank you very much and to all of you, good afternoon. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you.